Hi there, my name is Scott Phillips. I'm the president and founder of Starfish Medical. Project management is a very delicate, nuanced skill in this kind of environment. And over the years, we've had to develop a deeper insight into it. You need to combine elements of a psychologist and a program manager and understanding all the key technical decisions in your program and the client relationship expectations and the internal team dynamics and, this, and the budget and the timeline. And so it's a very specialized set of skills and nobody shows up with everything that they need. So we've developed a program we call PMU, Project Management University. And it combines explicit instruction, combined with uh, an assessment of where people stand, as well as a mentorship aspect that can go on for months and years as people grow in their journey of project management. So today you're gonna hear from some of our top project managers and the head of our project management team and they'll share some of the insights they've developed over time. I think you'll find it really interesting. Thank you. When it comes to defining the mission, this is where we lean heavily on our Pathfinder process, which is set up to ensure that we are looking broadly enough at the factors involved in product development to ensure that it will be successful. We want to be very clear about the goals of the program so that when we move on to develop a custom tailored program solution for our client, we have the end game in mind. One of the ways we achieve maximum value to the client is we execute our projects in a way for them to achieve their goals in best case scenario. So a good example of that is if their the client goal is to get into clinical trials as soon as possible, we can establish a minimum viable product to get there. So it wouldn't be a product that would be easily manufacturable, but it would be a product that would allow them to perform a clinical trial in a minimum amount of time and, and usually design effort. One example of that is a client came to us with a, a cart-based system and although we've designed plenty of custom cart-based systems, we leveraged an off-the-shelf cart and a bunch of off-the-shelf components to minimize the amount of design time needed to build the system and uh, it resulted in them getting a, a clinical trial system out uh, uh, in a greatly reduced amount of time and uh, facilitated their clinical trial process. We have clients that come to us and they want to take their product to a successful clinical trial. These products aren't necessarily representative of the final commercial version. For this, we need to look at the development phases. We need to look at which portions do we need to accelerate and which portions do we need to move forward in the development cycle itself. Aspects which we will need to accelerate are the generation of the risk analysis file, the detailed design specification, and architecture. All these are required in order to generate the verification reports. Aspects of the development cycle that we want to move forward are manufacturing controls, inventory controls, inspection procedures, creation of a PFMEA, and specific ma manufacturing validations for critical and high-risk manufacturing processes. All these are captured in a design plan and the schedule or Gantt chart. So with the mission defined, planning is an area where creativity really enters into the role of the project manager. Here we want to make sure that we are working backwards with the goals in mind, developing all of the milestones along the way, keeping a very close watch on the constraints. This is our budget, our schedule, and then the funding available to support the program. And throughout this process of planning, we are ensuring that as we are developing it, we are involving the entire team to ensure that we are fully aligned on the approach. A Pathfinder is a tool to help look at all aspects of the program before we dive into the first steps. So typically we would look at phase zero, phase one, phase two, and that's product definition, uh, prototype development, and manufacturing before uh, diving into the first core technology challenges. That way we can be sure we're not investing a bunch of time solving specific technology issues and then later on realizing there's some regulatory hurdle or marketing problem we haven't quite anticipated. The process of capturing risks in a risk registry document and bringing that with the client sometimes shed lights on the aspects of the projects that are not well known to the stakeholders. For example, on a specific project, Starfish Medical was in charge of designing the device and the unit, and the client was in charge of designing uh, the consumables. After going through the process of risk registry and assessment, uh, the client became more aware of the severity of the risk and how it could impact the entire program. So that ended up being uh, followed up with, with some additional conversations and additional scope was defined in order to mitigate that risks 
as early as possible to ensure the success of the program. We had a client come to us and they had developed this really cool assay to develop a disease state. Uh, and uh, they asked us to help them out with a problem where they had sold off the rights to that technology in the US, but they had the worldwide rights to the rest of it. And so they asked us to come and develop a blood shipping device for them. And we said, you know what would be great is do a, do a Pathfinder uh, with them to see you know, how, how that would work and what that would look like. And what came out of the Pathfinder process was actually not to come up with a shipping device, but rather take a look at their, their assay and convert it into something that was much more robust. And we ended up making an ELISA assay and a lateral flow assay, which they were able to ship out worldwide. And that became the product. That was the project strategy. So that's a good example of why uh, having that mission well defined up front and using the Pathfinder process is a really good thing for defining the, the project. With the plan in hand, this is where the execution begins. And we all know that things will change. Some of the sources of change are expected, such as technological hurdles that we'll encounter or learnings from our human factor studies that we build into the plan. Other sources are less expected, such as shifts in the regulatory landscape, the competitive landscape, or disruptions to the funding for the program. But knowing that these things will change is important, and given that we have focused previously on defining a clear mission, aligning with the team around a plan, we can engage the entire team to be looking out for some of these threats and opportunities on the horizon, engaging project managers to spearhead collaboratively updates to the plan. When it comes to product development, visibility is incredibly important. By knowing what factors could potentially impact our clients' requirements and how stable these things are can help us to tailor our development approach and adopt an appropriate level of agility. Now these factors can be related to funding, the competitive marketplace, laws and regulations, even personalities. One example that comes to mind is the recently heightened awareness surrounding cybersecurity threats and vulnerabilities. Now formal requirements around this have really only been introduced um, within the last year or so, but with appropriate uh, regulatory awareness, Starfish has been able to broaden the scope of our software development and risk management efforts to address cybersecurity concerns and prevent costly program implications downstream. Sometimes it happens that there are certain disruptions to our plan. For example, a technology or a product is not quite ready for commercialization. It can happen that a prototype costs $1,000 and we need to figure out how to make it cost $200 in order to be commercially viable. It happened to me that a client came to us precisely with that problem and we tailored a program specific to them that allowed them to unlock the funding and the funding then to back up the development of the medical device product. So often pivoting is seen as a disruption. And, uh, an area where we, we often have to pivot is in formative evaluations during human factors assessments. This can often, when done too late in the design cycle, have a disruptive effect on the core engineering, it can have a disruptive effect on the program schedules, and it can have a disruptive effect on the expectations of the device. We plan for this early in design cycles while the core technology is still being refined in POC stages by doing low fidelity formative evaluations. How we do that is give low fidelity models such as card, foam models, whether it be a cart, whether it be a handheld instrument, or within a GUI, to representative users, those actual end users, and get their feedback early in design cycles so we can tandemly develop the core technology along with how that is going to interface with end users. Those end users may be patients, they may be trained clinicians or physicians, but the idea here is that we're getting that end user feedback early in cycles so we can pivot early. And it no longer becomes a pivot that is disruptive. It is in fact a core element of how we design and our principles we put behind designing, is to understand from the outset that we're going to be doing this and we're going to be able to pivot in a way that will not disrupt timelines, schedules and budget.